Psalms 30, 1 through 5. I will extol you, O Lord, for you have lifted me up and have not let my foes rejoice over me. O Lord, my God, I cried out to you, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought my soul up from the grave, and you have kept me alive that I should not go down to the pit. Sing praises to the Lord, ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment, his favor is for life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his most holy word. I read that this morning, not only for your hearing, but it is just something that over the past week I have had to be reminded of. As pastors, most of us, not all of us, but most of us are natural encouragers. We, we try to encourage people during times of loss. We try to encourage people during crisis of faith. Well, we try to encourage people just in, in, in daily living. But every once in a while, because we are human beings, we need encouragement as well. And I needed to remember that although it may seem like it is night, that joy comes in the morning. The problem is that even in hearing that, night is different depending on what time of year it is. During the summertime, nights tend to be short. But we know during the winter there, there are long nights and I must stand here and tell you that after this week, I cannot help but feel that we are in the midst of a long winter night. I preached last week about unity, unifying a nation by unifying this church. And you know, it probably came off last week that I was a little bit annoyed. And I was, but that annoyance has left and it, there, I can't even describe how I felt toward the end of this week. When I finished preaching last week, there were seven people in this world that were alive that are not here today. And lest we forget who they are, I want to read their names and, and say a little bit about what I might know. Alton Sterling, 37, a father. Died July 5th, 2016, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Fernando Castilli, 32. Died July 6th, 2016, suburb of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Brent Thompson, 43, Dallas Transit Police, a father, a newlywed, a man that had been married only two weeks, died July 7th, 2018, Dallas, Texas. It's Patrick Zemeripa, 31, Dallas Police Department, father, served in the United States Navy, two tours of Iraq, and two tours of duty in Iraq that he survived, died July 7th, 2016, Dallas, Texas, Michael Crow, 40, D Dallas Police Department. Former Wayne County Sheriff, Wayne Co Detroit, where my hometown is the county seat of Wayne County. He was a native of Redford, Michigan, which is a western suburb of Detroit. Died July 7th, 2016, Dallas, Texas. Lauren Irons, Dallas Police Department, father, husband, he was called the big cop with a big heart, died July 8th, 2016, Dallas, Texas. And Michael Smith, 55, Dallas Police Department, father, husband, 27-year veteran of the Dallas Police Department, former Army Ranger, died July 7th, 2016, Dallas, Texas. As I was 
looking at some bios for these individuals. A, a sister in Christ of Michael Smith wrote this about him. She said, Mike exemplified Christ in the way he loved, cared for, engaged with, and ultimately laid down his life for others. If Mike could tell you one thing, I'm certain that it would be this. Brothers and sisters who do, do not want, brothers and sisters, we do not want to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like those that are in the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. First Thessalonians 4, 13 and 14. And I will admit, even then, some comfort is brought, but I was at a point in this week where I honestly said, God, if this is what it is going to be like, would you please return now? Could you just please come back? Because I don't know how much more of this many of us can take. Weeping endures for a night, but joy comes in the morning. Even during a long winter night, we have to remember the sun will rise, morning will come, and joy comes in the morning. Even in the midst of a long winter night, we have to remember God is still on the throne and Jesus will return when he's ready. And that's, that's a good thing. It, it was really good this week that Jesus didn't return when I was ready, but that he will return when he was ready, when he's ready. But there's something else that needs to be focused on, and that is that even, as I said, even during a long winter's night, we know that morning will come. We know that the sun will rise. We know that there will be joy. We know that Christ is still on the throne, but we also must remember that we as Christians have a responsibility to bring light into a darkened world. Darkness cannot exist where there is light, and the more light there is, the less darkness there is. And so that led me to believe if we, the church, want change within this world, we have to present more light. And so that's what I want to talk about today, being a light in the world, being a light in the world. Our text for this morning comes from the gospel according to Matthew chapter 5, verses 14, 15, and 16. I'd ask that all who could would please stand in reverence to God's word. Bringing light into the world, the gospel according to Matthew. Chapter 5, verses 14, 15, and 16. These are the words of Jesus Christ. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify the Father in heaven. As we look at this text, you may be seated, I'm sorry. As we look at this text, it comes from a section of scripture that is probably one of the most well-known, even amongst non-believers, even amongst those that don't study the Bible. They know this section of text because it's the Sermon on the Mount. So before getting to this point, Jesus has talked about Blessed are the meek, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you, blessed, blessed, blessed. And then he says, and you are the salt of the earth. 
He tells, he's, he's telling them all of these things as they sit before him. And then he comes to the point where he says, you are the light of the world. You are the light of the world. And so let's look first at those first two verses, that first verse and a half, where it say, he says to them, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden, neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. He is telling them that they, can, they are the light of the world and they cannot hide that light. They have to allow for that light to continue to illuminate throughout the places where they are. Again, the only thing that can cause darkness to flee is light. Darkness and light cannot, op cannot occupy the same two spaces. And so he's telling them that they are the light and that they need to make sure that they are illuminating the things around them so that there is less darkness. Darkness will not be totally eliminated until Christ returned, but it can be diminished. He's also telling them, don't try and hide it. Don't try and hide the light within you. Allow for people to see it. In the last verse, he says, allow for people to see your deeds and so that the people can see what you're doing. And, and that can seem kind of odd to us because we're taught, we're taught humility. This text it has nothing to do with lack of humility because the very last section of the text tells us, yes, we do, you do want people to see what you are doing, but not for your own glory. When we look at the very last line, what does it say? So that the glory may be to the Father in heaven heaven. So you're allowing for people to see these acts, not for your own glory, but for God's glory. And just like Jesus was speaking to those individuals as they sat at his feet at the Sermon at the Mount, we today must realize that we are the light of the world, but we must also realize the source of that light. It does not come directly from us. We have this light within us because it emanates from the Holy Spirit. So we have given our life to Christ. The Holy Spirit has become a part of us, and the Holy Spirit is the source of the light. It's important for us to remember that. We are not the source of the light. The Holy Spirit in us is the source of the light, but we still must allow for that light to shine. If we want change, if we want things to be better, we can't just sit back and hope for it. The church has a responsibility to make sure that we are allowing for the light of Christ to shine. We have a responsibility. I can't just sit back and, 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 and talk about how, how, how bad things are. I can't just sit there as I'm watching the news on TV and wonder, Christ, will you please return now? No, I have to allow the light from within me to shine and to try and to push back the darkness. I have to do something. We, the church, has to allow for our light to shine. So you ask, well, I hear you. But what is our responsibility? We are the light of the world. What is our responsibility being the light of the world? First of all, if the Holy Spirit is the source of the light, our first responsibility is to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit may ask us to do things sometimes that, again, don't make sense. The Holy Spirit may ask us to do things that we don't necessarily want to do. It may ask us to approach people we don't want to approach. It may ask us to step into ministries we don't want to step into, but that might be where the light needs to be at that point in time. And so if we are going to be the light of the world, we have to be obedient to the source of the light, which is the Holy Spirit. The second thing we have to do is we have to be unashamedly and unapologetically Christians. We cannot be ashamed of the God we served, for he has said, if you are ashamed of me, I will be ashamed of you before the Father. And we have nothing to be ashamed of. 
And we have to be unapologetic. We cannot apologize for God's word. There are going to be people that don't like it. Tough. The word's the word. And so we have to be unapologetically and unashamedly Christians. And part of doing that is letting our light shine. When we go back to our text, he says, don't put your light under a bowl. Don't hide your light. And too many, too many God-fearing Christians today are hiding their light. They are not allowing for that light to shine because they don't want people to know. One of the worst things that I hear is that, well, my faith is private. It's just between me and God. Show me. Show me in God's word where he says this doesn't have anything to do with the people around you. It's just between me and you. Please show it to me. It is not a matter. There are certain things that are between me and God. There are certain things that are between you and God. But God tells us to go. He has said we are the light in the world. And we can't be the light in the world if we are ashamed or if we are trying to hide who we are. So, yeah, I hear what you're saying, Pastor, but there, there would be a price that I would have to pay for that. And there would be a price that I would have to pay at work. There would be a price that I have to pay at school. There'd be a price I have to pay with my friends if I let that light shine and let them know the true nature of my faith. And to that I said, there was a price that Jesus paid for you to be able to have salvation. So the loss of a friend... The loss of a colleague, a little bit of people talking about you is not a high price to pay based on what Jesus paid. And the fact of the matter is, no matter how much you try to hide your light, you can't really do it anyway. I learned that from my pastor when I was growing up, the late Dr. Charles William Butler. I remember he was preaching a sermon once and he was telling a story about how he wanted to fit in. He wanted to make sure that, that people didn't ostracize him and, and didn't look at him differently. And so he's in the waiting room at the hospital uh, when his first child is about to be born. Now, for those of you that are wondering, waiting room, uh, there was a time when wives, when they were having children, they went back to the delivery room, and there was this area with a bunch of nervous-looking guys. It was the waiting room because husbands didn't go back into the birthing area back then. This is the late 50s, early 60s. So you had a bunch of guys that were sitting out in the waiting room waiting for the doctor to come and say, it's a boy or it's a girl, because you didn't have ways of figuring it out then either. So you didn't know until the doctor told you. And so he's in this waiting room with these other men, and, and a few of them, they're talking and they're cussing back and forth, and, and he's going to fit in, so he's doing it too. He's, he's letting a cuss word or two fly, and he's talking, and they're talking, and then finally one of the guys said, wait a minute. It's something different about you. What do you do? And he said, he, his shoulders went up around his neck, and he looked at him, he sheepishly said, I'm a student at the seminary down the street. You see, we can't hide it. No matter how much you might try to hide the light, you can't, so just let it shine anyway, unashamedly, unapologetically Christian. Third thing is we have to find a way within the church to work toward unity and work toward uh, conciliation. In other words, we have to be on the same page and are trying to achieve the same goal. We have to get to know each other. Now, what do I mean by that? The church, the body of Christ, is a very diverse body, not only in spiritual gifts, but in ethnicity, in nationality, in culture, in values, in gender. It, we're diverse. And so 
we, you have to assume, what we have to learn is that we can't assume that the way that we see things, our, the way that we have experienced things is the same as our other Christian brothers and sisters. And so what we have to do, first off, is we've got to take the time to get to know each other. A person raised in Kansas City had a very different experience than someone raised in Greensburg, Kansas. And because of those different experiences, there are certain things in the world that they see differently. We have got to, as Christians, get to the point where we can look past those things, come together, learn from each other, talk to each other, and find common ground. The Catholic sees the world, sees theology differently than the Baptists. But we have to come together, find common ground. I had a different experience than you all. My experience as an African-American man raised in the United States is different than your experience would be. And perhaps Maybe I've been a little bit negligent in not speaking to that difference because it's okay. It's okay. And, and what, it, what it helps us to do is it helps us to understand why things in the world might be the way they are. We, the leadership and I were talking this morning and I, I told them, I said, you know what? Here in Kiowa County, I know Sheriff Tedder. I know our undersheriff. If I'm driving through Havlin, which recently I did, and I get pulled over by the Cuyahoga County Police Department, I know, okay, I did something wrong. He looks in, he says, Pastor, you were speeding. I say, eh, yeah, <laughs> I was. And he says, okay, next time slow down. There, 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 there is no anxiety there. But I can tell you, if I'm in Wichita, doesn't matter. They don't know Pastor Ruff. And if I get pulled up, the, the, if I see lights behind me in Wichita, I get nervous. And that is the experience of most, if not all, African American men in our country today. We have to get to the point as Christians, we can't depend on anybody else. As Christians, where we can sit down and say, okay, let's have a conversation. Let's find unity. Let's find a common ground. Let's figure out how we as Christians can solve some of the problems that the people outside of the body of Christ won't. We have to let our light shine. Another thing that disturbed me last week, I was, we're in an election season. I was watching a TV show that said, that 52% of Democrats fear Republicans. They are afraid of people who call themselves Republicans. Now, for those of you that are Republicans and say, ah, that's silly. Well, 49% of Republicans fear Democrats. Now, why is that a problem? Well, guess what? In the body of Christ, we have Democrats, we have Republicans, and it's hard for two groups of people that are looking at each other and saying, I'm afraid of you to come together and have a reasonable conversation, to come together in unity. And the fact of the matter is, we in the body of Christ have got to decide whether Christ is going to be our God or whether, whether politics is going to be our God. You've got to make a choice. And if you choose politics, that's fine, but then don't say that Christ. Because that, that brother or sister next to you that doesn't have the same political belief as you, they, they are not someone you need to be afraid of. They're someone you need to talk to. I'll give you an example, a personal example. There is a group, an organization called Nuns on a Bus. One of their leaders is a nun by the name of Sister Simone Campbell. Now, if Sister Campbell and I were to sit down and we were to have a conversation, there would be a lot of things that we disagreed on. 
But can we, can Sister Campbell and I, can you and our brothers and sisters in Christ, can we agree that we want to help the poor? Can we agree that we want to feed the hungry? Can we agree that we want to clothe the naked? Can we agree that we want to get the word of God to people who do not know God so that they might have a chance to set for salvation? Can we agree on those things? Yes, we can. Now, where we're going to have differences is in how we do it. Sister Campbell and I are not going to have the same idea of how to help the poor, how to feed the hungry, how to clothe the naked, how to present the word of Christ to those that have not heard it. We're not going to agree on that, but we agree on what we're trying to do. So what do we do? We come together, we find common ground, and we let our light shine. Right now our light is being dimmed by our differences because that's what we're focusing on. The body of Christ cannot be divided because the Bible tells us what happens to a house that is divided. It cannot stand. And so our responsibilities as the light of the world, are to listen to the Holy Spirit because it is the source of the light. It is to be unashamedly and unapologetically Christian, and it is for us to come together in unity, commonality, get to know each other, and find common ground. What happens when we do this? The first thing that will happen is that we are going to be able to push back the darkness. There will always be darkness in the world until Christ returns, but more light means less darkness. If we're letting our light shine, the darkness cannot be where the light is. So there will be less of these events that we saw in the past week. There will be less San Bernardinos, less Orlandos, less Dallases. Some may still happen, but I would be much more happy with less than more. And the only way we're going to get there is if we let our light shine so that it can push the darkness back. The second thing that, we're, that it will do is it will provide hope. It will provide hope because we can remember that, yes, it might be a long winter night, but Joy comes in the morning. It will provide hope because people will remember that God is still on the throne. It will provide hope because people will remember that we serve a risen Savior. It will provide hope for those that don't believe because they will see hope in us. And that leads to the third thing. It will build the kingdom because the people outside of the body of Christ will see that light shining in us. There will be that curiosity. There will be that desire to know what is this? What is this thing that you have? And we have the ability at that point to talk about Jesus. We have the ability at that point to tell them about our risen Savior. We have the ability at that point to let them know about the God that is still on the throne. But it comes first through action. You can talk to a person about God all you want. If they aren't seeing the light of Christ in you, then what do we get? We get that, all of that talk about being a hypocrite. We have to allow for our light to shine. And so, this is my charge. I, this is my promise. I'm going to do a better job as a Christian, as your pastor, of letting my light shine. Say, well, how much can one person do? One person can do what one person can do. But if you have 51 persons, those 50 can do more than the one. And 100 can do more than the 50. We have to remember, our faith started Jesus had 12 disciples, and he told them to go out and turn the world upside down. You would be surprised at what you can do. You'd be surprised at the lives that you can touch if you let your light shine. There's a, a song that I learned when I was growing up, and I'm sure we all know it. It's this little light of mine. So that's my challenge. That's my promise that I'm going to let my light shine. And my challenge is that you 
let your light shine so that we can push back this darkness and so that we the church can be unified. We the church can make our world just a little bit.